Hello and welcome to the latest presentation of the Rift Valley webinar series. My name is Richard Griscom and I am the host for today's talk. If you are participating in the live webinar, you can submit questions or comments in the chat module of the Zoom application. Today's speaker is Dr. Helen Eaton. Helen is a member of the Uganda Tanzania branch department of SIL International, and she has extensive experience researching the Sandawe language of central Tanzania, as well as a number of Bantu languages spoken near Mbeya in southern Tanzania, uh, as a part of a career that spans over the past two decades. Helen has produced a number of publications based on this research with a strong focus on the domains of information structure and narrative discourse, and also including a grammar of Sandawe in 2010. Uh, please join me in welcoming Helen as she gives her talk, Sandawe as a Linguistic Island, Distinctiveness in Diversity. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to give this presentation and thank you to those listening now and um, those listening later as well. I'd like to start with a disclaimer and a warning. The disclaimer is that I'm not a sociolinguist and this presentation is far more sociolinguistic than papers I normally give. My PhD was in discourse, my day job involves more orthography than anything else, but a couple of years ago I was asked to talk on Sandawe at a workshop on linguistic islands in Africa. And what I'm showing you today is a version of that presentation. I thought it would be a good fit for the interests of this group. It's very much an overview of Sandawe, the language, the history, its speakers. And as for the warning, I'm in Tanzania, I'm in Mbeya, so I'm at the mercy of Tanesco, which I'm sure you'll understand means I may cut out at some point, but hopefully not. If I do, I've got other ways to get back online. So um, please bear with me if that happens and hopefully I can come back in after a few minutes. So what I'd like to talk to you today about is this idea of Sandawe as a linguistic island. And as you all know, I'm sure it's surrounded by languages from different language families. So in this basic sense, it can be described as a linguistic island. I'm going to touch on some diff different definitions of linguistic island at the end of this presentation um, and look at to what extent Sandawe fits these definitions because it's not quite as simple as it sounds. But uh, I would like to spend most of my time today considering the ways in which the Sandawe language and its community are distinctive, even in the midst of the great diversity surrounding them. So in order to do this, I um, will be looking at these areas. So I'd like to start with um, the Sandawe language community in general, some general points about the community, then some issues uh, relating to its history and the classification of the language. And then I'm going to talk something about the socio-cultural characteristics and also some typological features of the language and also touch on attitudes to the Sandawe language and ending with this question of whether Sandawe does really count as a linguistic island. So before I continue, um, I would like to mention my own history with the Sandawe people, um, my credentials for talking about their language on their behalf. I first lived in the Sandawe area 23 years ago, and I spent about four years in total living there, including a three year stretch from 2002. And since moving away, moving down to Mbeya, I've visited the Sandawe area often and during a visit in 2016 I conducted interviews with four Sandawe speakers specifically on this topic of Sandawe as a language island or a linguistic island so their contributions have informed much of what I'm going to be talking about now. So at first glance what is most striking about the Sandawe language community in Tanzania is that it's not a linguistic island in the middle of a, a sea of Bantu, which is what we might expect if we thought about Tanzania as a whole, where the vast majority of languages are Bantu. But again, probably we all know Sandawe is surrounded by members of three of Africa's four major language families. Whether Sandawe itself is a member of the fourth, Khoisan, and whether that is a family is a matter to, for debate, as we'll see. But in this map, we can see the languages neighboring Sandawe. So we've got Nyaturu, 
Gogo, Rangi, or Bantu from the Niger Congo family, Iraq, Alagwa, Burunge, Cushitic from the Afro Asiatic family, Datoba is Nilotic from the Nilo Saharan family. So we have a great mixture. The Sandawe community is uh, located in what's now the Chemba district of Dodoma region. The area that the community occupies is part granite hills, part flatlands. It's about 50 miles north to south and 40 miles east to west. And there are also small language communities, Sandawe language communities elsewhere in Tanzania, specifically in Dodoma, Arusha and Dar es Salaam. As for the numbers, uh, there is the University of Dar es Salaam Atlas, which um, puts the number at 65,935. And another recently published estimate is also around 60,000, based on that atlas and some other uh, recent est estimates as well. So turning to the geographical origin of the Sandawi language community, this is not a matter for debate, unlike the classification. Uh, linguistic, archaeological, ethnographic research, it's all pointed to the same conclusion. The Sandawe are indigenous to their current area. Tenra was one of these researchers in the 60s. He found support for this view in the oral traditions of the Sandawe people. But today, if you ask many Sandawe, they will express a belief that their ancestors came from Southern Africa rather than the other way around. Um, they've heard that some of the people there have cliques in their language and um, they have therefore assumed that they have come from there. Um, but as a linguistic island based on the geographical origin of the Sandawe people, we need to describe the island as regressive. That is, it's a residual settlement from what was historically a much larger group. The island status has been created by the movement of the peoples around them rather than the movement of the Sandawe themselves. So communities of historically related languages have moved away or have disappeared through language shift or intermarriage and communities of unrelated languages have moved into the area creating this island status. This um, history of the Sandawi people has been viewed as, as a kind of a puzzle by some, particularly by Newman, who questioned why, why the Sandawi were able to survive as a distinctive people group and not be displaced or absorbed when other people groups moved into the area, as often happens. And he put forward the thesis that the answer to this puzzle lies partly in the unsuitable quality of the land and the climate for farming and herding. So over many hundreds of years, other people groups passed through the area, but they didn't choose to settle. They moved on to more suitable areas, leaving the Sandawe alone. But also he posits that some settlers did stay, but in small enough numbers that they were incorporated into the Sandawe. And this helped the Sandawe to survive by expanding their traditional hunting and gathering subsistence to include some farming and some herding under the influence from these settlers possibly even as far back as 3,000 years ago. And uh, borrowings in the Sandawi language, clan origin myths, archaeological remains, such as houses and pottery fragments, all support this view that Sandawi have had contact with Cushitic and Bantu peoples over many, many years. And in the 90s, based on research from earlier in the last century, Newman stated his belief that the Sandawi themselves are not likely to disappear they now number in excess of 30,000 and their unique language remains locally in vogue, serving to buttress myths both amongst themselves and their neighbours of distinctiveness. All told, the concept of being a Sandawi has a good chance of persisting well into the next century. And we are in that next century, so, so far, so true. The long history of contact with other language families and isolation from related languages has created something of a challenge for those who wish to classify the Sandawi language as it's spoken today. There is also another challenge in that there are possibly languages which are now extinct, which may have shown the relationship between the surviving languages more clearly, so we have a lot of missing links. There is another difficulty in the, the languages which may be related to Sandawi have, tend to have very large sound inventories, which makes it hard to establish distant genetic links through lexical comparison, as Sands found in her 1998 thesis. 
The term koisan is commonly used um, in a very negative sense to refer to non-Bantu, non-Cushitic languages in Africa which have click phonemes. And in recent years, research has been focusing on elucidating the linguistic relationships amongst such languages in order to replace this negative definition with a more positive, linguistically motivated one. And Sandawe is in the picture in that question as well. Various researchers have looked specifically at Sandawe. Eldigan, for example, has investigated the place of Sandawe in relation to these so-called Khoisan languages. And he doesn't question the existence of a relationship, but he does question whether it's genetic or aerial. And Sands, as I mentioned, has also looked at this area and discusses Khoisan as a whole. She evaluates the roles of borrowing, chance, relatedness, and her conclusion with respect to Sandawe is that it seems a little more likely than not that it's related to the Khoisan languages of Southern Africa. And most recently, Gulderman in 2014 argues that uh, Sandawe is an isolated or at least unclassified language. Um, although he notes that it bears typological resemblance to the Khoisan languages of the Kalahari Basin area, more specifically to the Khoi Kwadi family. So moving on now to um, socio-cultural characteristics of the Sandawi community, if we leave language aside, the Sandawi people do not always seem to be that distinguishable in socio-cultural terms from the surrounding people. For example, there's no obvious differences in the houses they build, the ways they farm, um, the ways they raise animals, the clothes they wear, the long history that they have of living alongside other peoples and incorporating parts of their culture means that some degree of cultural distinctiveness has clearly been lost. And of course, it's also exacerbated by government policies regarding agriculture and the promotion of Swahili as a national language in recent times. The Sandawe are living off the same kind of land with the same resources and the same climate as their neighbours. So in many ways, they have a similar lifestyle. However, that said, um, sociocultural differences do remain, which mark the Sandawe people out as a distinct people. Newman stated that undoubtedly the single most important factor in delineating their ethnicity is the Sandawe tradition of hunting and collecting. And this was an observation based on field research in the mid 60s. So that's, there's quite a lot of time has passed since then. There've been significant changes in Sandawi lifestyle. Newman was able to state that a Sandawi man is seldom seen without a bow and arrow in hand ready for a kill should the opportunity present itself. And that's clearly not true today if you walk around the Sandawi area. Uh, Tenra was studying the Sandawi people at a similar time to Newman, and he observed that the women still do much food gathering in the bush, and some of the men continue to spend a good deal of time collecting honey and hunting small game. And this really isn't the case today. Um, government policies regarding collective farming in the late 60s and 70s, together with population growth, the decline of game to hunt, this all means that today, most Sandawi spend more time farming, more time raising animals than hunting or gathering. But it's not that hunting and gathering have disappeared. And uh, when asked about this, the Sandawi I interviewed stressed that hunting and gathering was a thing of the past. Even one of the interviewees who I knew personally did himself go hunting. And this is possibly an indication of embarrassment associated with this lifestyle. The local non-Sandawe I spoke to were very quick to note that the Sandawe are very good with a bow and arrow and they're, they have great ability in tracking animals or people even, thieves for example. Um, but the Sandawe themselves were reluctant to um, mention this. And Newman found it was not unusual to hear the Sandawe derided as bush people and it's perhaps in reaction to this attitude which is very much still in evidence today that the Sandawe I spoke to played down the continued importance of hunting and gathering to me as an outsider. And similarly, none of the Sandawe I interviewed mentioned their physical appearance as a way in which they differ from the neighboring peoples. But aside from their language, this is the most obvious distinctive characteristic of the group. 
However, equally, there are many people within the Sandawi community who speak the language and have Sandawi ancestry, but don't have what might be termed a typical Sandawi look. So in this picture, we've got four, five people who are all Sandawi, um, but the man in the white jacket on the end doesn't have a very Sandawi look in comparison to the others who have more of the typical Sandawi look. Within the Sandawe community, Tenra found that there was a, a dialect divide. Um, the Dekla Sandawe and the Bisa areas form the two principal divisions of Sandawe country in terms of ethnic, cultural and linguistic identity. So on this map, the straight uh, purple line, diagonal purple line, on, uh, shows the dividing line between these two areas that Tenra identifies. So the Tekla are on the western side of the line and the Bisa on the eastern side. And Dekla, which means proper, he described as um, the Sandawe who consider themselves to be the Kuth Sandawe, and the Bisa are the Unkuth. And he found that although this distinction was, um, this division was distinct and recognized by the Sandawe themselves, they also maintain that all Sandawe are one people forming a single tribe. And this division was reflected linguistically in slight and gradual differences between the two varieties. And this division was not really found in the later research that I personally was a part of. We found similar slight dialectal differences determined geographically, but no Sundawe speakers who described any linguistic variety or division of the people group as Dekla, and no Sandare who would describe their own variety or themselves as Bisa. They would describe other people as Bisa, but not themselves. The main dividing line according to dialect is as shown, and that fits with um, what Tenra found, but there's a slight further distinction. You can actually identify a Western variety and a central variety as well, which is the curved purple line. Tenra found that all Sandawe can understand each other without difficulty, and this is certainly true of the dialect situation as it stands today. There are differences, but they are very slight. So before we compare the Sandawe language with the languages to which it may or may not be related in Southern Africa and also to its neighbouring languages, it's helpful to give a very, very brief overview of the phonology and the grammar of the language. So this will be fast. Uh, in terms of vowels, Sandawe has 15 vowel phonemes. Oral vowels have a phonemic length contrast, but nasal vowels do not. They're always long. There are 44 consonant phonemes, of which 15 are pronounced with a velaric ingressive airstream, i.e. a clicks. This table gives the 29 other consonants, the aggressive consonant phonemes, the non-clicks. There's quite a few things to note here. One, there is contrastive aspiration in voiceless plosives, and there's a, an interesting variety of laterals and affricates. And then these are the 15 clicks pronounced with a velaric ingressive airstream. As you can see, there's three places of articulation and then five types. The um, voiced clicks are very rare though. Syllables are open with some exceptions. Um, there are syllables ending in a glottal stop. There are some ending in consonants created by vowel elision or through borrowing words uh, with pre-nasalized plosives or nasal plus plosive sequences. Clicks occur both word initially and word medially. And Sandawi is a tonal language. It has two tone heights and contour tones analyzed as sequences of level tones and some very interesting pitch phenomena, which Elderkin in particular has looked at. Turning to morphosyntax, with the exception of some nouns referring to people, nouns are not inflected for gender and they are optionally marked for number and specificity. Third person singular pronouns contrast two genders. Sandawe is an agglutinative language and the language is rich in derivational suffixes and postpositional clitics. Subject marking in the most basic clause type is by pronominal clitic, which attaches to non-subject clause constituents, often many, in accordance with information structure considerations. Some intransitive verbs have suppletive stems, which reflect the number of the subject, and some transitive verbs have 
Sepleta stems determined by the number of the object. Sandawe distinguishes realis and irrealis rather than tense, and it has varied means of expressing aspects, such as by verb coordination or object marking. It has very unusual means of expressing aspect. And the dominant constituent order is SOV, but there is great variation um, in, in this order in order to express different uh, information structure options. So comparing Sandawe to the Khoisan languages in typological terms is a challenge because there's great diversity in the Khoisan languages. So as Gulderman puts in concluding a uh, typological survey of the Khoisan languages, clicks aside, there is no such thing as a Khoisan language type. So some brief comments can be made, but we have to bear this in mind as we start. Um, some notable points of comparison and, and differences that are going to follow now that are based largely on the survey conducted by Google Demand. So in terms of phonetics and phonology, um, he notes that the only features which can be said to identify um, a Khoisan pattern are the use of clicks, very obviously, and the phonotactic stem patterns, um, given here the base, very basic patterns. And in both these features, Sandawe is somewhat divergent. So it only contrasts three places of articulation for clicks. It lacks bilabial and palatal. And also clicks occur at a lower ratio in relation to non-clicks when compared to Khoisan as a whole. And Sandawe also allows polysyllabic words which don't follow the Khoisan phonotactic stem patterns. And it allows a full range of consonants in non-initial positions. So in those ways, it's quite divergent from this Khoisan language type, if we can even call something a Khoisan language type. In other features such as vowel colorings, Sandawe shows more similarities with the Khoisan languages, however, and in particular with the subgroup Khoi Kwadi. Um, with respect to tone, all Khoisan languages are tone language, but in the main, they have been analysed with three or four tone heights, whereas Sandawe has been analysed with two. And in terms of morphosyntax, Gulderman also finds a similar situation to the one holding for phonetic and phonological features, in that there are very few features exhibited by the Khoisan language group as a whole. Only host final morphology and gender and number marking in the nominal system can be put forward. And of course, these are simply features that are common cross-linguistically. Even if you exclude Hadza, Tanzania's other click language, it still leaves more morphosyntactic differences than shared features in the Khoisan group. However, a subgroup does become evident if Sandawe and Khoi Kwadi are taken together, as was also noted in relation to phonetics and phonology. So this group is defined by Gulderman as um, having a particular constituent order, SOV, head final, postpositions, alignment type is accusative, and there are certain nominal categories, gender class ratio, overt gender marking on the noun, regular number marking. And although Sandawe does have these similarities with the Khoi Kwadi group, we also need to note that there's great variation in these features between Sandawe and Khoi Kwadi as could be seen by looking at Elderkin's work on noun structure in Sandawe and um, some of the languages from that subgroup. So if we turn now, instead of comparing Sandawe with the languages uh, that used to be its neighbours, perhaps, and to now the, the currently neighbouring languages, we of course encounter the same challenge again that we noted in relation to the Khoisan languages, namely that the relevant languages themselves are so diverse. So it's very hard to know how to, to make the comparison. But of course, there is um, a study of the Tanzanian Rift Valley area by Kiesling, Mouth and Nurse, which presents comparative research um, on Sandawi and its neighbours. And they note phonological and morphosyntactic similarities which cut across the different families. Um, for example, the presence of a lateral fricative and verbal plurality. These are similarities to be expected as the languages, although from different families, have been in contact for such a long time. 
And Kiesling et al. Um, calculate the degree of similarity of the languages in the contact zone, and Sandawi comes out as the most divergent of the group, but at 61% on the membership index, still a member, still part of the group. Looking at the lexicon, uh, the Sandawi lexicon shows evidence of many loan words. Um, Eret and Eret give a following, uh, the following helpful summary. Many of these came from southern Cushitic languages, most notably from the East Rift language Quadza or from an extinct close relative of Quadza. A lesser number of loanwords in Sandawi came from Alagua and probably also Burungay of the West Rift subgroup of southern Cushitic. Sandawi also has loanwords from the southern Nilotic language Datoga, although a majority of these may have entered Sandawi indirectly via the Rimi or Nyaturu language. There are many common words which are borrowings in Sandawe, such as, for example, jaka, woodland or outside, which can be shown to be from Proto-Bantu, or klongo, sky, cloud, um, which has uh, a cognate in Kwadza. And these words are used by Sandawi speakers today without any awareness that they are not native words. They're very common words and um, no other word is used in the Sandawi area for these things. The Sandawi do also use a lot of Swahili loan words, but they're aware of the origin of these words, these much more recent loans. And most Sandawi speakers, except the very old and children who are yet to go to school, are able to speak Swahili. But Swahili abil abilities do vary from village to village, depending on mainly whether there are non Sandawi speakers living there, whether there are schools, and how close the village is to the road. Thinking about attitudes to the Sandawi language, I, I interviewed um, the four speakers about this and they generally didn't express any particular feelings of pride or shame towards their language when they talked to me about it. They considered it neutrally, it's the language they happen to grow up learning, but they did say that there are other Sandawi who will hide their knowledge of the language and thereby their ethnicity when traveling outside the area, for example, to Dodoma because they fear being looked down upon and seen as backward or as bush people by others. Sandawi is considered a hard language, or if not impossible language to write both by its speakers and by non-speakers who've heard it spoken. But there is language development work in progress um, since 1996 through the efforts of SIL in cooperation with the Sandawi community. And there is an orthography in use, a chart of which you can see. There's also a lot going on um, online for the Sandawi language community. There are Bible portions, story booklets, calendars, newspapers, audio recordings, videos. Um, the website is www.sandawilanguage.com and it makes many of these products available for free. The audio and the video products in particular are popular in the Sandawi community and they are a source of pride for some. So in all I've said so far, I have taken it as read that Sandawi is in fact a linguistic island, but as is often the case, it does depend on how you define the concept. And if you're particularly interested in this, please let me know and I can share with you a draft paper that compares some specific definitions in some detail. But for now, to conclude, I would like to briefly make a few comments on the nature of Sandawi as a linguistic island. Firstly, Sandawi doesn't fit those definitions which assume a linguistic island has a mainland somewhere from which it's separated. The Sandawi language area is its own mainland. Other definitions stress that linguistic islands are temporary. They eventually disappear due to linguistic cultural assimilation. The Sandawi language area has been around for a very long time and it hasn't gone anywhere yet, so it doesn't really fit the traditional definitions um, in that sense. There's also commonly an association of social isolation with linguistic islands. But for Sandawi, this is not the case because we have Swahili as a lingua franca preventing that social isolation. So in these three areas, Sandawi is not what you might call a typical linguistic island. On the other hand, Sandawi is surrounded by unrelated languages and due to its use of clicks, this distinctiveness is undeniable. And distinctiveness, of course, is a, an important element in any definition of a linguistic island. 
The Sangdawe language is certainly distinctive in Tanzania as a whole, but its geographical location in a part of the country rich in linguistic diversity tends to weaken this distinctiveness in relative terms. But even that said, Sandawi still stands out as more island-like than the neighboring communities, with the possible exception, I think, of Datoga, as it's a single community with no related communities in the area, unlike the Bantu and Cushitic languages around it. The Sandawi language has retained its distinctiveness much more clearly than the Sandawi people have retained theirs, though, in terms of uh, appearance and culture, subsistence, as we have seen. So there's the question of survival. With, will the Sandawi language community survive as a linguistic island? If a linguistic island is not to be temporary, then it needs some protection in order to survive. So how are the Sandawi protected? Well, they can be said to be protected by their location in a geographical area not very much thought after by others due to the unsuitability of its land and climate for agriculture. There's also protection afforded by the diversity of the neighbouring languages. None of the surrounding languages dominates the local area and therefore none presents a likely direction for language shift. And there's also no motivation for language shift out of isolation because the overlay of Swahili throughout Tanzania means the Sandawi language community is not isolated from its neighbours. However, conversely, Swahili also presents the biggest threat to the continued survival of the Sandawi language as it does to other languages in Tanzania. Thank you very much for listening and thank you to these people for answering my questions and um, helping me in different ways, talking with me about the issues. For the sake of recording, here are some of the references. And that's it, thank you very much. All right, thank you, Helen. Um, this is a great presentation. And uh, I think we can now begin the uh, question and answer section. So if anyone would like to ask Helen a question or offer a comment, uh, you can do so by entering the text into the uh, chat module of the Zoom software. Uh, well, I guess I will start with uh, my own question. So I find uh, the situation really fascinating and the sort of delinking of the, uh, the notions of uh, cultural assimilation and language assimilation. And um, I'm just curious, uh, thinking of say a, a slightly different context, like the Hadza context, uh, we see these, uh, at least as proposed, that they're much more kind of linked together, that uh, when you uh, say when a, an ethnic group uh, no longer practices their traditional way of life, then that will be associated with um, language loss. But what we uh, seem to have seen here with Sandawe is that there's, there were significant cultural changes that took place uh, throughout the ethnic group, but the, the, the language is more or less still in place. So I'm just curious if you um, have any other comments to add about um, what might have contributed to that kind of delinking of the uh, language loss and the cultural changes. Yeah, it's a fascinating situation, I think. And um, I think possibly one of the factors is the, the time depth we're talking about, that the Sandawi have got used to this um, very gradual um, losing of culture without losing of language. And um, yeah, it, it seems to be a very stable situation. Over many, many years, they have um, gradually been moving away from their traditional subsistence and incorporating other aspects of culture, but um, they've never seem to move away from the language. And it, it really is a puzzle, as Newman um, stated in his, um, his work, that why, why does the language survive when the culture starts to blur and, and blend in with what's around it? And it, it's very interesting in the Sandawi area that um, when you look at the, um, the languages surrounding Sandawi, uh, they, they are so different, but if speakers of those languages move into the Sandawe area, if they marry, for example, and the children, uh, their children brought up with parents from different languages, those children in the Sandawe area will learn Sandawe. That is what they need to do, whether they have come from far away or from a neighboring group, they will learn Sandawe if they live in the Sandawe area. So it still seems very strong as a language, possibly because it's different, 
um, because it's so different maybe that uh, if it were another Bantu language and the, the people were losing their cultural distinctiveness, maybe the, the language would have been swallowed up by a bigger neighboring language. But because it's so different, um, it, it somehow protected itself. Um, it's got a, a kind of a barrier against um, a, being assimilated into other languages. It's such a different situation to where I currently am um, in Mbeya because here we have um, the, the boundary lines between languages are so uh, blurry that you you wonder is someone speaking Malila, is, is someone speaking Safwa? Um, but with Sandawe, there's never any doubt whether someone is speaking Sandawe or not. So possibly the the context of the surrounding languages, the different languages have just made the language seem more stable. Um, and the people themselves have been practiced at gradually adapting and um, but not losing, yeah, not losing their language, but gradually adapting other areas. It's it is a really interesting area because it seems quite different to a lot of other experiences. Um, that people have talked about in relation to other linguistic islands in Africa. All right, thank you. Um, so we've got uh, a number of related questions from Andrew Harvey. I'll go ahead and, and uh, read all of them uh, quickly. So uh, what is the origin of the linguistic island concept? What are considered linguistic islands par excellence? Is the uncertainty surrounding Sundaiwe as a linguistic island a product of the fact that it was really a unique case? Or is this a question of the whole concept of linguistic island, uh, perhaps needing to be broadened to, to take more cases such as Sandawe into account? And then he adds at the end, I suppose the heart of the question is, is Sandawe a strange case or is the concept of linguistic island in need of further exploration? Well, these are the questions that we looked at at this workshop on linguistic islands in Africa. And um, these were some of the questions that the, the organizers had before they started. There wasn't, they felt that there was a need to look at the definition um, in relation to Africa because generally people didn't. So I'm not a sociolinguist and this is not very, very much not my area, but the origin of the linguistic islands concept tends to be European and it tends to, most of the research has been on pockets of say Russian in Germany, for example. And um, these are the, the case studies that have provided the definitions and therefore these definitions often talk about um, the fact that a linguistic island has a corresponding mainland somewhere else, which obviously Sandawi doesn't have. So in that sense, it's not this kind of island. But in terms of um, how to describe what Sandawe is in its context, island seems a very appropriate word to use because it's surrounded by um, such diversity and it, it doesn't have any related neighbors. So this was um, the case for the, the workshop. I mentioned several, there were many presentations about different situations in Africa and possibly what was um, the standout point for me was that every situation was different. So there were some like Sandawe that um, fit the definition in, in some ways, but um, very much not in another. So um, we looked at during that workshop, the idea of whether the concept of linguistic island needs to be broadened when you take Africa into account um, rather than just Europe. And um, Sandawe is not a particularly strange case, but if you, um, but if you look at it and you, you start working out what are the parameters by which uh, linguistic islands um, vary, then Sandawe will tick a certain list of parameters and another example, um, the Ik language in Uganda, for example, will will take a different list. But there is what we looked at during the workshop was um, what is it that um, what is at the heart of the definition that people seem to understand more intuitively what feels like um, the essentials of being a linguistic island and distinctiveness is what comes out that. Um, when people have described a language as a linguistic island, it's because it's distinctive to what's going on around it. But the reason it's distinctive, the history of how it got there or how it stayed there, the future for it, whether it's temporary, whether it's stable, whether it's been that way for 3000 years, these are all the areas that are very different. So um, hopefully at some point there will be 
um, a volume coming out with the papers from that workshop, which um, will look at all the different uh, case studies we considered. And we worked together on some of these parameters, trying to decide what, what were the essential ones, what were just um, giving you different types of linguistic islands. So it's a very interesting area of research. I think the, the reason that it's particularly interesting to look at it in relation to Africa is that it hasn't been so far that people have worked on linguistic islands in relation to uh, Europe only, really. Hey, thank you. Um, I have a, a slightly different question. Uh, so you had mentioned that um, there was a report previously that there were multiple dialects of Sandawe. Um, and then later you found that uh, perhaps um, that was not the case or that perhaps the information had been kind of uh, construed in a slightly different way. Um, but I guess my question then is, uh, do you think that that represents uh, some sort of internal change in terms of the diversity uh, among the speech of the Sandawe, but then also in terms of the orthography, um, because it, it appears that you're working in a context where mutual intelligibility is not an issue, but there might be uh, language variation. Um, how have, uh, have you chosen to represent that in terms of the orthographic form? Yeah, the, the dialect um, situation was quite interesting. I think um, we, the general point that we found was that there is a distinction, um, a sort of west versus east with a, a slight central dialect too. But these are very slight differences and um, the, they didn't seem to correspond to groups, which was what Tenra found. He, he talked about the Kuth and the Uncouth um, as being very sort of distinctive ethnically, culturally, as well as linguistically. And we could find the linguistic distinction, but really the, again, the cultural distinction had blurred. So it's the same issue that the language has stayed stable, but the cult socio-cultural characteristics seem to have got more um, blurry over the years. But what we found in terms of orthography development is um, there's a lot more people in uh, the one area. So we went with the majority after um, having a meeting or had, having several meetings with representative speakers um, from different parts of the area. And fortunately, the differences are very slight. So it really isn't a big deal. Um, unlike some other languages I know. Um, so what we found was, um, for example, there is a sound, um, if I can find the chart, I can show you. Um, there's a sound um, on the left-hand side, um, the third row down, the word for heart, is either pronounced jigida or zigida. So it's a j or a z. And the decision as a compromise was made to write um, DZ instead of J. J is not used in the Sandawe alphabet. We could have used it. The majority say Jigida, a smaller group say Zigida, and as a compromise they um, decided to write DZ for that sound and um, then people can pronounce it as they like. So there were some very slight differences like that. There's also um, some, I remember particularly uh, the word for cow is humbu or mumbu. So there's an H and an M there. That one is harder. We've decided to go for humbu because that was the majority. So it was very much a community decision in how to write it. And um, we've not really had any issues where people have felt like this was not their language when they saw it written down. When people have written in Sandawi, you start to see the differences. There are some, uh, in some parts of Usandawe, the there are verbs which have a syllable um, missing compared to other parts. So um, you can see something of uh, those differences when people write, but it doesn't seem to be a problem with um, reading and understanding, which is great because it, it certainly helps the community to be more um, unified um, when it comes to language development. There doesn't seem to be a big problem there, which is great. All right, great, thank you. Uh, let's see, we have um, another couple of questions from Andrew Harvey. Are people highly mobile within Sandawe land today? Were they highly mobile within Sandawe land in the past? And he says, I'm thinking in terms of marriage, uh, large rituals, habits of making visits, etc." 
That's a really interesting question. I don't think I asked so much about that. So for the past, I'm not really sure. I think um, there were certain areas where there were certain rituals associated with these particular geographical locations. So there was some movement in that respect um, from what I've read in Tenra's um, ethnographic research. But um, today, people are not, uh, I don't think they're particularly exceptionally mobile or um, or the opposite. I would say they kind of average for Tanzanians in um, in a village situation that people do stay where they are, but um, children go to um, towns for secondary school and so on. I think it's probably more mobile than the past. Um, so maybe that will lead to some kind of changes in the in the future, but I'm not really very sure of that um, that area. Certainly the fact that um, farming is a is basically the standard way of living in the Sandawe area means that um, people uh, do tend to stay put rather than move around with um, herds and so on. So that's certainly a, um, an incentive to not to be quite so mobile. All right, great, thank you. Well, I think that is uh, all of the questions that we have for today. Um, so just briefly, I would like to announce the next presentation in our webinar series, which actually is a roundtable discussion. Um, this will take place on Wednesday, June 26th um, at uh, 2 p.m. GMT. And the focus of the discussion will be on documenting and describing the languages of the Tanzania Rift Valley, uh, discussing methods and methodology. Uh, so I want to thank our speaker again, Helen Eaton, and I also want to thank everyone else for participating today, and we will see you at our next webinar.